Hello, welcome to another episode of Albertson and Davidson Live. I'm Keith Davidson. I'm Stuart Albertson. We're glad you joined us. Yeah, thank you for being here with us again today. And we got a few things that we would like to talk about and see if we can't uh, demystify some of this trust and will stuff that we uh, spend our lives doing. So let's start off with uh, our breaking news of the week. And this is a new appellate case that came out not too long ago. And this is an interesting case in the sense that, in this case, a business owner tried, wanted to or tried to leave a gift in his trust to his employees. Sound like a good idea? Well, it might be. I don't know. Would it, I think two of the three employees were very happy he decided to do that. Well, Kayla's shaking her head, yes. Our, yeah. our assistant paralegal, Kayla, who's working the uh, laptop for us today, she thinks it's a good idea. Right. All right. Well, here's what happened. So in this case, this is the case of uh, Schwann versus Perman, and it comes out of the first appellate district. And uh, our decedent, Walter Perman, owned a company, and in his trust, he actually said that he is going to leave gifts to each of his employees, there's three employees in particular who he's going to leave gifts to, if they were employed at the company at the time of his death. So there's a condition for them to receive the gift, and that condition is, number one, he has to die, and right. number two, when he dies, they have to be employed at his company. Right. Okay. And so the company was Control Master Products, Inc., and um, I think we looked up, they, do you remember what they did, Kayla? I can't remember. But Some they, type of metal works? Yeah, they made something, and it was a valuable company, and it's always interesting to me how people make their money. You know, we have, we've had clients that make a fortune doing all sorts of interesting things. But anyway, so he had this company and he had these employees. One of them retires. Before he dies. Before he dies. Okay. And the other two, well, before he dies, he actually sells the company. So he, he, he just completely disposes of the company. The new company who bought his company actually bought all the assets and the name of the company. And then his actual corporation got a different name, and he started selling model trains or something. Choo-choo trains, that's yeah. right, yep. A little bit of a hobby of his, I suppose. Yep. So then he dies. Okay. So now the, all three employees, the one that retired and the other two who had worked at the company up until it was sold, come in, and they say, we want our gift. And naturally, the family says, no, because you weren't employees at the time of his death. Which the trust requires. Which the trust requires, right. So... The court has to decide, are, are these people, these three employees, going to get their gift, or are they not? Right. And, on, and, and if they are going to get it, on what legal principles would that be allowed? Now, that's the interesting part, at least for us, right? So, first of all, the argument that the family tries to make is, well, the term must be employed by the company. The term employed does not include if the company was sold. So Correct. It, it's employed unless the company sold, in which case they don't have to be employed. That's how, this is how the uh, the employees wanted to interpret the trust. So there was no there was no exceptions to the general statement in the trust, the express statement in the trust that you must be employed at the time of my death. Yeah, it, it didn't give any exceptions. So it didn't say, but in the event I sell or any of these other contingencies that possibly could have happened, which. It just goes to show you how hard it is to draft trust. Well, and I was just going to say that. I mean, we see that people that create trust, don't they really just want to control things beyond the grave? Isn't yeah. that really what they're trying to do? Sure. And it's so hard to figure out what the future holds. The right. thing I thought was interesting was that he was, I don't know when he signed his trust, but he was in negotiations for four years to sell his company right. and kept that hidden from all these employees that whole time. Well, yeah, and then after he sold the company, he kept telling the employees, hey, don't worry about it. You're taking care of in my trust. You're going to get a gift in my trust. Like in his head, right. I think he honestly thought... He intended it. It's going to happen. And yet the language says you must be employed at the time of my death. They weren't employed, technically speaking, because the company didn't exist. One wasn't by retirement right. before he died. Right. And two weren't because the company was sold. Yeah, so what they wanted, the employees wanted the court to do is to kind of rework the language and say, well... This employed at the time of my death should only mean employed if the company hasn't been sold and I still own it. And if it's possible to be employed at the company. Yeah, and so the court said, well, we, we can't just rewrite the trust. Right. And so that was, a little, that was one problem. The second problem was, or the second issue was, 
was it possible to excuse that condition? So let's say that the trust can't be rewritten, but can you tell the employees, but you, it was impossible for you to meet that precondition, and therefore we're going to excuse that precondition? Now, now before you give the answer, it seems to me that I actually could go with the court either way on this. Oh, really? Yeah, because I, I think the court probably wanted to get to the right result, and so they weren't going to get there by the express language in the trust. Right. If they just did a plain Jane legal analysis of this, I think that the two employees that are asking to say, hey, just deem us to be employed because it was impossible for us not to be employed. You know, we didn't leave like this other employee did, the one employee did. And so I think the court looked for a way to remedy that. And, and so you can continue from there. Well, actually, I was going to ask you what, so you have these two issues you have to decide. Are you going to read the language of a trust of the trust to say something different from what the black and white words say? Well, and that's the, I think that's, that's the first issue. That's the, and that's the important thing. I remember in law school that bad facts make bad law. And <laughs> right. this might be one of those cases. Yeah. And so I think what you have to do is you have to look at the law and the law is supposed to be steady. The law doesn't change quickly. And, and you've got to have certain rules. There can always be a few exceptions, but primarily you need a strong general rule. And the strong general rule for trust is if the language is clear and unambiguous, you go with the language. That's how you interpret a trust, right? Now, if there's some ambiguity in there, okay, now we, we were opening up, extrinsic evidence can possibly come in. We might look at other terms in the trust to see if we can make the whole thing read together nicely. But this trust is very clear. There's no exceptions. He planned it. It probably wasn't the best planning in the world, especially if he knew he was going to be selling his company. Uh, but I think, I think they lose, and, they, and if they lost on the cold, black-letter law language of the trust, I wouldn't personally have a problem with it. I'd, I'd feel bad for them as, that if they were my friends or my family, but I'd say that's the right result because we need the law to guide us on future cases, not just this case alone. So the trust says you must be employed at the time of my death. You weren't employed at the time of my death at this company, and therefore you lose. Correct. And, and I'm going to assume, since the law assumes that when, it's, when somebody creates a trust, that when this gentleman created this trust, the law presumes that he understood every provision of that trust, right? Yeah, Which right. we know is not accurate, but that's how the law presumes. Yeah, yeah, right. And we have to go with that as the guiding light. And so if he sold his company then theoretically he knew that this gift was being done away with. Right. I mean, that's what the court said, too. So the language is you had to be employed, you weren't employed, you're out. And that's a really harsh result. And so now you're the judge. Let's say that you're the judge and you're hearing this, and you come to that determination. You're a good judge. You follow the law and the rules of construction of a trust, and you say the language is not unambiguous. And I'm sorry, you lose on that prong. Mm -hmm. How could you then, as a good judge who doesn't want to go home making a bad decision that day, if you truly believe the employee should inherit something and that the decedent intended that they inherit something, how would you maybe see if you could rectify this situation? And I think that's ultimately what the court did, which is it was impossible to meet this precondition because the company had been sold. And so the the impossibility of being able to be employed wasn't the employee's fault. It was the owner's fault because he sold it. And for that reason, they shouldn't have to meet, as long as they were employed, as long as they could possibly be employed, which was at the time that he sold, then they met the condition, which is interesting because, and I don't know if you ready to give away the, the ending. Yeah, of go the ahead. Case. Sure. So here's what happened. The two employees who were employed until the company were sold win. The employee who the employee who retired before the company was sold lo lost. They lose, and it's because they voluntarily stepped down from the company, even though it was a retirement. Now, isn't they that they made that choice? Isn't that a little bit age discrimination going on yeah. there? I mean, if they truly <laughs> retired and they were of age to retire, yeah. you're going to hold that against them because it seems to me their possibility of continuing on as an employee would take them above and beyond their retirement age if that, in fact, was their age. I don't know if that, that was the facts of the case, but it seems to me a little age discrimination there. Or their abilities. Like, what if they couldn't work anymore? They were right. somehow, you know, they hurt their back or whatever. Right. I don't know. If you were the estate planning attorney and you have this client come to you and say, I want to incentivize my employees, I love these you know, three particular employees, they do great work, um, how would you attack this? Well, I mean, and it's easy in reading this case to look at this in hindsight. So in hindsight, you know, there should have been some provision made for in the event I don't own the company because I sold it or, so or something like that, then this is what I want to have happen. And isn't that the art of lawyering, trying with, with the data sets that you have in a case – predicting 
with in percentages, obviously, what the future holds. Isn't that kind of what we lawyers do? It is. And I think that's the difference between a good drafting attorney when it comes to estate planning and a not so good drafting attorney. And it's not that this was necessarily a bad plan, but it wasn't as good as it could have been, obviously, in light of what happened. And I don't think it's that hard to anticipate, well, okay, you want to leave your employees this money, but what happens if they're not employed? Do you want to just name them? And so they're going to get it whether they're employed or not. Do you want to have an exception that employed unless I sell the company or for some other reason I don't own it? Or do you want to send the, a letter to the client saying, look, if you ever sell this company, you got to change your plan because your employees are going to be out. Right. Why not just fix it to begin with? That's right. what I would do. And then if the, if the client, for whatever reason, every once in a while you come across a, a very stubborn client, didn't want to, then you better have that letter in there. It's interesting. I'm wondering if these intended beneficiaries, these three people, the one that got out, is there a legal malpractice claim there? It's probably not strong enough, but you're yeah. getting into that territory and so that's where estate planners need to be careful. You know, when I do things in my cases, I always think about what am I doing right now and what's likely to happen in the future because of it. And when you start brainstorming that issue, you come up with all kinds of neat, creative ideas that you need to address right. to make the case better. Well, and that's I think a lot of people say, why are these estate plans so complicated? Why are they expensive to draft? Whatever it is. This is why, because well, there's a lot that you have to think about if you're going to do it properly. Well, the proper estate plan is very broad, but very narrow, right? <laughs> right. Go ahead. Go do it. Yeah, I guess so. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, in hindsight, it's easy to say they should have made a different provision here, but I don't think it's that hard to foresee either. I think you should have been able to foresee it. I mean, that that's something I think an estate planner has to think about. If this gift is to the employees of this company, as long as they remain employed, there's a lot of things that could happen. They could go bankrupt. Uh, somebody could buy half the partnership. Or the, half the company, is that a change of ownership? Yeah. I mean, there could be all kinds of things that could go on But you there. said this isn't a good malpractice case. Why is that? Uh, because I think that uh, there's probably notes from the, the drafting attorney and that this is what the guy wanted, and they put it in there, and they went over it you know, five different ways, and that's exactly how he liked it, and he signed off on it. So I think you would have a hard time showing that the attorney uh, lacked the ability to uh, properly draft that estate plan. Uh, the, the, the malpractice cases on estate plans like this or when there's a signature missing or something. That's that's usually when that comes Those in. Those are the better ones. Yeah, where it says two spouses are required to amend the trust and they only get one spouse's signature yeah. and it changes the fortunes of somebody. That person's harmed and I think you've got a good malpractice case. But these drafting cases, they're difficult from a malpractice standpoint. I mean, do we even know if the set law would have wanted that provision of an exception if I sell the company? That's I right. Mean, that's the speculative part, right? Is Correct. The employees can say that, yeah, clearly he wanted it, but... How well, do you yeah. prove that on a malpractice clearly, lawsuit? Clearly, he wanted what benefits me. Yeah, yes. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Well, that's yeah, you know, that's usually how it works in litigation, <laughs> right? Most litigants think that. Right. So anyway, that's our uh, case for this week. And so, if you happen to be uh, getting a gift from your employer, or business owner, and pay attention, Kayla, make sure it's uh, written in <laughs> black and white. So let's go on uh, to our next segment where we're going to give our opinion on some interesting news items. So we actually went through, and by we I mean uh, Kayla, went through and found some interesting uh, celebrity estates. So let's talk about some of these celebrity estates and what happened to them. Uh, and Did I ever tell you about the time I talked to Jay Leno? <laughs> no, I haven't heard about that like a million times. No, I haven't. You almost opposed him. Almost opposed him, yeah. But he didn't have to. I didn't have to, unfortunately. Apparently yeah. he wasn't very happy with it. He, he's not a funny man when you're telling him you're going to take his deposition. <laughs> so you call up and you say, I want to come down and take your deposition. He's not so... He, he wasn't friendly. Not hilarious. But you know who I did talk to um, were Ben Stiller's parents, Jerry and... Yeah, Jerry Stiller, of course. Jerry Stiller and Ann O'Meara. Yeah. And that was before, obviously, I think Ann passed away a couple years ago. But the funny thing about that is you had no clue who Jerry Stiller was. I did not know. Who you Jer never watched Seinfeld. I did not know who Jerry Stiller was. And so when I called uh, Jerry and Ann up, they were, I think they were in New York, we talked for like an hour. Wow. And th uh, apparently they knew an actor by the name of Jack Albertson back in the day. I guess he was back <laughs> in like the 1940s or something. A long lost uncle. And, and then they're like, are you related to Jack Albertson? And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. But wow. they were the nicest people. And they were both on the phone at the same time. 
they were they asked me questions about myself. It was like I felt like I was in La La Land. It was such a a weird phone call. It was a great phone call, but it was just yeah. strange that they really just wanted to spend time talking on the phone. Were they like loud people? Did they speak? They loudly? weren't loud. They both spoke over each other. Right. Uh, but it was like you could tell they'd been married forever. They yeah. seemed to really like each other, and they were laughing and joking. So I mean. Wow, what a great, great, successful marriage. And you have to be one of the few people in all of America who never watched Seinfeld. Like, how did you not watch Seinfeld? I don't, they have the show called Friends, too. That you didn't watch that either? I didn't watch Friends either, oh no. God. No, I was. Kayla, did you watch Seinfeld? Absolutely. She says she did, okay. And Friends. And Friends. Yeah, I mean, how did you not? George's dad, George Somebody t- said, said to me the other day in the restroom, can you spare a square? And I had no idea what that meant, so. <laughs> You can you can watch them. It's on reruns all the time. Yeah, but you so know. you've heard of Howard Hughes. Uh, he yeah, he was a little neurotic. Yeah, he was he was a recluse at the end of uh, end of his life, right? And there's that story of him staying at a casino in Vegas, the Desert Inn, or one of those. I can't remember which one it was. He was taking up the whole penthouse, and they, he was staying there for months and months. And they wanted him to leave because they wanted to rent it and have it available for some of their high rollers. And he wouldn't leave, so instead he just bought the whole hotel. Right. And that's how he got into the hotel business in Las Vegas. So he dies, and this is in 1976. His estate was worth $2.5 billion, apparently, which I don't know if that was the value back then or the value today in today's money, probably back then, knowing Howard Hughes. And he left a handwritten document that was found on the desk of a Mormon church official and the will supposedly left a bequest of $156 million to a guy by the name of Mel- Melvin Dummers. Maybe change your last name. A gas station owner whose account of giving Hughes a ride when he was stranded in the desert was used as the basis for the 1980 movie Melvin and Howard, which I'd never even heard of that movie. Great movie. Oscar-worthy. <laughs> Did you watch it? No. Okay. So you liked it. So the... So there's a handwritten will left on somebody's desk, supposedly by Howard Hughes, leaving a gift of $156 million. Is there a chance that that might be contested? Well, well anytime you have more than a million dollars, it's going to be litigated. <laughs> and absolutely. sometimes less than that, Yes, right? right. So what do you think happens with this, uh, this ho- supposed holographic will? Well, did they test it for uh, his signature to see if it was indeed his signature? Well... I'm not sure about that because this news story didn't fill me in on that. But what what it does say is eventually the amount was divided among 22 cousins. <laughs> so what does that tell you? I guess he got nothing. Yeah. So Mr. Dummers got nothing. And they must have gone intestate. So that meant the will must have been invalid. And, you know, apparently Howard Hughes didn't otherwise have a trust or will. And his family was forever grateful. 22 cousins. Extended family was forever grateful. That's insane. Yes. So here's another one. Do you remember uh, Le- Leona Helmsley? Uh, she was so kind and sweet to everyone. <laughs> I don't think so. If you don't know who Le- Leona leave, Helmsley is, look it up. Didn't she leave a lot, like a, a bunch of money to her dog, I so think? So that's what we're going to talk about. Okay. So in 2007, right. she dies, and she leaves uh, a bunch of money to her Maltese, whose name, by the way, was Trouble. Okay. How much do you think she leaves to Trouble? Um, probably $20 million in a pet trust. Oh, pretty close. $12 million. Okay. So what is the life expectancy of trouble after he gets $12 million? Ten years? I don't think so. I think his life expectancy would be a few days. Oh. Whoever's going to inherit after trouble uh, dies. I see what you're getting at. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I think. And there's probably no crime for killing an animal at that time. By the way, did you know in California that January 1, 2019, that family pets have been given the status of people? Really? So now not only is uh, – and part of this was some guy walked up to – a lady and took her dog and threw it over a cliff. Ah, okay, that's so, horrible. And there was not a whole lot of charges they could bring against the guy. Really? But now you're going to be able to say, hey, that was a f- member of the family. And also mm-hmm. in custody battles now, there's going to be just there's going to be dog support, and there's going to be the sharing of the dog back and forth. I think it's just fascinating. So well, I can just tell you in terms of the amount of money that my family spends on dog food that they've been <laughs> viewed as people for quite a while, as yes. far as I know. Yes. Maybe not legally speaking, but right. in terms of financially. I but I, I digress, so please go on with okay, Ms. So Ms. Helmsley's this, dog. Let's say that somebody leaves you $12 million, but you're going to use that $12 million during your lifetime, and upon your death, it goes to me. Okay. So what is your life expectancy after you get that $12 million? Well, right? if you have a gun, not very long. No, it'd be like minutes yes. tops. Yeah. So everybody's mad that Trouble gets $12 million, and so they fight it. 
And uh, apparently there was actually death threats against Trouble. Oh, poor Trouble. So they had to spend $100,000 a year. In security. Just on security. Wow. Just to secure the dog. You know, you wonder, you wonder, do you just hook the dog up to an IV at some point and just put an artificial heart in there? And <laughs> just... I don't know. If you're the trustee, you know, it behooves you to keep this dog alive. Well, and I'm not sure you're doing Trouble any favors by giving it $12 million. So ultimately, the inheritance to Trouble was reduced. So the court decided trouble didn't need twelve million. So guess what it was reduced to? Two million. It was exactly two million. I'm just guessing. I don't know. You're, <laughs> I was not given any of these no. questions ahead of time. It seems to me that two million for any dog seems sufficient. <laughs> really? Not my Nova. Oh. My Nova deserves twelve million. All right. Well, that might be true. All right. So those are our uh, celebrity cases for uh, for this week. That was earth shattering. Wow. Wasn't it? Yes. There's some lessons to be learned there, though. Mary Leona Helmsley? <laughs> Be her dog. Be her dog. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> and now you're a person. Yes. If you are. So that's right. all the better. Yeah. I, and I may have overstated that. Maybe they're just considered members of the members of the family. Mm. But uh, it'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out. Yeah, well, it will be. A whole new era of family law practice. Well, in California, for a long time, it's had pet trusts. You literally can create that's a, right. a trust for your pet. It's in the California probate code. Right. Like we... Our legislature took time That's to right. put that in the code so you could create a trust for your pet. Yeah. Sure, why not? I'm glad they had the time to do that. <laughs> yeah, me too. A lot of pressing issues, but that one that one got crossed off the list. That's right. So let's go on to our practice pointers. And Stuart, you came across something interesting this week that you thought might be useful to share, at least for any lawyers out there who are interested in kind of what the practice of law. Well, and it has to do with uh, defending depositions. Yeah. And I think that most people learn how to take a deposition, like you did, uh, through experience. Yeah, watching other attorneys. Yeah, and, they're, and they're usually the attorneys you're going against. And yeah. you pick up little tips and tricks along the way, right? Right. But have you, you know, when do you really sit down and like read the statute on how to conduct yourself at deposition, how to um, lodge uh, objections at deposition, what are appropriate objections and what are not? Yeah, I mean, I think most people look at the practice guide, and it tells you that, the, you know, you can only, ob- at deposition, you can only object to the form of the question. Whatever that means. Whatever that means, right. Yeah, so I think that um, I was in this, uh, I've, you know, I've done probably several thousand depositions in my career. I don't know. Right. I'm, I'm sure I'm over a thousand. And uh, I go to this deposition, and I'll tell you, the, the hardest depositions are the ones where the lawyer's really not that good at taking a deposition. And I could tell that this lawyer, she'd taken her fair share of depositions, but her questions just, they weren't on point, they weren't good, they were inappropriate for the most part, inappropriate in the sense that they, they weren't allowed to be asked in the way she was asking them at a deposition. And so I was lodging objections, and um, she also would ask the same question over and over again. And then she would add things to the question, but it was really the same question before. And so I was saying objection, asked and answered, and those kind of things. And I was just making a record, right? Because if you don't make a record and you don't make the objection, theoretically, you waive that objection at the right. time of trial. Which is a scary part for most lawyers, I think, because they don't like the idea of waiving anything. Well, that's right, especially privacy, right? You can't yeah. waive uh, the attorney-client privilege or spousal privilege or psychotherapist patient privilege or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you probably could claw that one back with a court order, but that you, you just don't want to do it. So I, I just decided I was going to go to the statute this morning because I wanted to understand for myself from the statute, not the practice guides, because I think you're going to go to five different practice guides, and they're all going to say something a little bit different. And that's because I don't think the statute is entirely clear. Right. So the reason the statute is not entirely clear is because it tells you in a not-so-clear way, the objections you do not need to make at deposition, and they'll still be there at trial for you if you need to make them. Hmm. Once you understand those objections, I think by deductive logic, you know the balance of the objections are the ones you need to say in deposition, or you're going to waive them. So you kind of have to back your way into it. So it's not, here are all the objections. The statute doesn't say, here's all the objections you can make. That's right. In fact, uh, the language actually, I'll I'll just read uh, some of it here. It says that uh, irregularities of any kind occurring in an oral deposition, of any kind. I mean, that's I, that's wide open, right? Mm-hmm. And it says that if, if those might be cured by an objection, and you don't make them, you waive them. And they say these irre- irregularities include, but then they say, but are not limited to. 
Wait, so that starts off with irregularities? Well, errors and irregularities. Wow. So what it comes down to is it really comes down to the conduct of the manner the deposition is being taken, the conduct of the attorney taking the deposition, the conduct of the deponent, the conduct of anybody else in the room. And so there's a bunch of rules, obviously, for how you can appropriately take a deposition. I'll give you an example. There's a, there's a case called Rifkin versus Superior Court, R-I, uh, R-I-F-K-I-N-D, I believe. And I think it was decided in 94 or something like that. And it, uh, Rifkin stands for the proposition that you can't ask contention questions at a deposition. And what are contention questions? Those are questions where you have to understand a legal principle, and then you have to apply it to either the facts or who can testify to those facts or what documents apply to those facts. Well, that's something that some associates can't do. We've come across associates that can't just simply, <laughs> from a legal analysis standpoint, do that analysis, right? But it's a lawyer function is what you're getting at. I mean, uh, th lawyers need to be able to put the facts and the law together and come up with some sort of legal analysis. That's right. And so this lawyer the other day, she starts off her deposition. We had produced, I don't know, let's call it a thousand documents. So we've got a stack of thousand documents sitting there that we've produced in the case. Yeah. And we, you know, we had our associates spend hours and hours and hours putting those together, putting them in the proper categories, and we produced them. So the, the lawyer thought she was really going to get a slam dunk here, and she looks at my, she looks at our client, and she says, your, your uh, legal position, your legal contention here is that uh, you're the beneficiary of this trust. Is that true? And the client's like, yes. <laughs> right. And she's like, you brought these documents today. I want you to point to every single document, identify every single document in this stack that supports that legal position. <laughs> like on the spot. Like on the spot. The yeah. client's supposed to go through and just pull out the ones. That's right. And okay. so I told the lawyer we weren't doing that. And uh, she, So is that an irregularity? That's an irregularity. That's, okay. and that's the manner. The manner in the deposition being taken is wrong. The conduct of that attorney is wrong. And then the attorney decided that, okay, when she got th once she got done with the document, she tried a few more of those questions, and I told her we had to move on or she, we could go talk to the court about it. Um, then she started asking, well, do you contend that X happened in this case? And, of course, I'm lodging obje appropriate objections, and the client's like, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> and, okay, what facts do you have to support that? I said, no, no, you know, counsel, you're going to have to ask her what you want to know about a particular document. If you want to talk to her about a document, pull it out, give it to her. You can run her through it. You can ask her about it. You can ask her about facts right. as she understands them, but you can't ask her to come up with all those facts so that you can just sit there and poke holes. And I think this lawyer had probably learned those tricks because they've been used against her in the past effectively. And you know why they're so effective? Because they're so unfair. It's so hard to ask a client to understand a legal principle and apply it to the facts of the case. It's, it's something that's really difficult to do. I mean, aren't you essentially asking a client to do a legal analysis, which is what the lawyers do, not the, not the clients? That's correct. And so if, if it was used against her at some point, she probably didn't object, I would assume. And uh, I, I would say it's, it's not just unfair, it's, it would be virtually impossible. It is. And, uh, you know, you know me, I'm very polite at deposition. So I did offer to the lawyer to take a time out. And I offered her, I could even print out for her Rifkin versus Superior Court. I said, you know, I think if you read this case, it'll, it'll help you in better forming your questions. And, of course, she didn't want to do that because her client was there. And so we, we moved on. And, and, but the neat thing about it was we had two days back-to-back -back depositions of both of our clients. And the first day was all of these inappropriate questions. Yeah. The second day, there was very few inappropriate questions. And they came kind of <laughs> at the end of the second day. So yeah. I felt better about that. Do you and think look, she read the case? I don't know if she read the case or not. But I, you know, I don't mind our clients having to answer questions, even hard questions, in a case. Let's, let's do the discovery. Let's find out what's going on. But you're not going to ask them something that they can't answer because they don't have the ability to answer that because it's a legal analysis that's involved there. As opposed to just the facts. Like, just give me the facts of what happened here. Were you around dad? Were you there when he signed this? Were you, what was your you relationship like with your father? Right. Did you love your father? Did you spend time with him? Tell me all the Christmases. I mean, did you guys exchange uh, holiday greeting cards? I mean, all of those are very appropriate questions. Yeah. And then, you know, one of the other questions she said is, do you think it's fair for you to steal someone's inheritance? <laughs> and it's almost like me asking you, Hey Keith, when did you stop beating your wife? Yeah, there's no good answer to that. Right, and, and that's in law school. They always 
teach that one as a classic example of assumes facts, not in evidence. You know, when did you stop beating your wife? Because it assumes that you ever did beat your wife. That's correct. Yeah. When did you stop using methamphetamine, Keith? Well, that assumes that I did stop using mes- <laughs> methamphetamines. <laughs> yeah. Assumes so, facts, not in evidence. So I think that, you know, uh, if you were to take the time, and I actually uh, got together with my group today, and we went through and we looked at every single objection that you can make at a deposition. And believe me, I don't want to make objections at deposition. I only make them when I have to. Mm-hmm. But obviously, anything that's privileged, like attorney-client privilege, you, you want to make that objection. So when they say, what did your lawyer tell you about that? Which I've heard lawyers say that in deposition. Objection, attorney-client privilege, and a direction not to answer that question. Yeah. And then there's attorney work product. We all kind of know what that is. Uh, argumentative. So if they're and you see lawyers do this. They try to prove their case in a deposition. Right. And you kind of know they're novices because that's really not the place you're, you're just trying to get facts, witnesses, and documents at a deposition yeah. to better understand all those things so that you know how to attack someone at trial. Right. So when you see somebody doing the Perry Mason stuff in deposition, I'm never impressed by that. No, it doesn't work anyway. Assumes uh, disputed facts as true. You know, do you, do you want to dis, uh, you think it's okay to disinherit people, don't you, when you don't believe anybody's being disinherited? Right. Or stole, you said the question was, why do you think it's okay to steal this inheritance? Right. It's like, well, I don't think I'm stealing anything for one thing. But. That's right. That's right. And then there's uh, misquoting the deponent. Have you ever seen that? Where the, oh, the yeah. lawyer, I mean, so they'll misquote and say, well, you testified earlier that you hated your father when, in fact, they never said anything remotely close to that. Well, my favorite one on that, too, is that, You know, they'll take something out of context that was said maybe earlier in the day, and they'll say it in the afternoon, and then they'll say, you said earlier X, Y, and Z, and then you'll object and say, you know, misstates the evidence, and then the attorney will look at you and said, well, how do I misstate it? Well, I'm not here to tell you how you misstated it. I'm just voicing my objection. Making a record. I'm just making a record because I don't have it in front of me. You're saying something that I don't think is what was said this morning, so I'm going to object. Right. And then, you know, I, I, I always find it odd when they look at you and say, well, how was I inaccurate? It's, it's not my job not my to job. tell you how you're inaccurate. Just making a record here. Right. My favorite one, and the, the, this lawyer, this particular lawyer, did this time and time again. She would tell uh, either one of our clients, you remember when you were at that hearing four months ago, and you remember when you said, so she doesn't pull a transcript out. She doesn't, okay. And then <laughs> Four months ago? Yeah, and then, and then, she's, and then she <laughs> says, do you, were you at so-and-so's deposition in this case? And do you remember when they said, again, not pulling out a transcript? It'd be so easy, too, just to have the transcript. Yes, I mean, why not have the transcript? Do you agree with this? Do you not agree with this? Yeah, so anyway, wow. um, the other one's calls for, calls for speculation. And I like this one. Um, we're not allowed to coach our clients. At least that's what the, the Discovery the Act says. Yeah. yeah, it says you can't you can't coach a client. So yeah. in other words, if I tell my client every time I step on your foot, say yes, that's inappropriate. <laughs> right. But there are times. I haven't seen that one. <laughs> there are times when the opposing lawyer is just fishing, yeah. and they're asking things that I mean I'm pretty sure my client doesn't know anything about this. And because clients are people, and in normal day conversation you try to help people out, mm-hmm. you hear somebody talking and. You might even try to like finish the sentence for them. Yeah, you fill in the gaps. You fill in the yeah. gaps. And so when I hear a question where I'm thinking my client doesn't have the basis of knowledge, either personal knowledge or any knowledge to really answer that, I'll lodge that objection. Objection calls for speculation because I think you're asking them to guess is what you're doing. Right, right. And then there's one I rarely use. And the reason I don't use it because I think it's detrimental to the other side if they ask this kind of question. And that's vague, ambiguous, confusing, or unintelligible. So let people ask confusing questions. Yeah, because then the answer could be left, right, or in the middle. I don't know. So that's not a big one. (laughs) Compound, I don't care about compound either. And compound is where you're asking two questions in one or more. You know what's interesting about the last one too, the vague and ambiguous thing, is usually when you make that objection, what does the questioner do? They're like, oh, let me restate it. Right, and I'll make it yeah. better. Now, actually, make it better. you know, our, our partner Jeff made a good point that when somebody makes an objection in deposition, he says, I seriously consider it in my head, and if they've corrected me, I thank them. Jump all over. And I restate yeah. the question yeah, in, an even, in an even more, in a better way, so right. that I make sure I get the best testimony possible. And then the other side can't say asked and answered because, well, no, you said that was vague. Now it's not vague. Right. <laughs> The other one is that the questions are too general. And this attorney also did this. You know, I find that attorneys that aren't good at deposition, they fall into these traps, all of these traps. And that's Mm -hmm. why these objections are available. Yeah. And she would say, "Um, do you remember when, you know, you and your dad got in that argument? Yes. How'd you feel about that? (laughs) 
<laughs> okay, that's too broad. It's too general. It calls for a narrative response. Oh, great. Yeah, Thank it felt, you. felt great. <laughs> so, so that's the other one. Um, asked and answered. I use this one, and this is a scary one. For why is it? Why does the why does the asked and answered objection that we make? Why do we make it? And what are we afraid of? We're afraid of diff, uh, differing answers. So if you say the car is red on one answer, you don't want to be asked the question. Hear your client say it was blue. You and want it to be consistent. And so how this normally happens is your client answers a question in the morning in a deposition. Yeah. And then in the afternoon, the lawyer comes back and asks the very same question again. Right. And so this is also one of those calls for speculation, ideas, call, uh, objection, asked and answered. That's already been asked and answered. And, you know, we'll have lawyers turn to us and say, that's not an appropriate objection. And I didn't ask it. I asked it. I mean, they, they're giving you like this big, long explanation. <laughs> yeah. And at the end of it, you're like, I'm just making a record counsel. Right. The so, court will decide later on if I'm right. right or not, which, you know, I like to think I'm right. But By the knows? way, this lawyer that we were going against the other day, she also, uh, uh, she, uh, she didn't move to strike <laughs> m- m- our clients' responses. She struck them. Oh, <laughs> I mean, she, yeah. She just went right to She's the She's like, I'm striking that I'm answer. I'm just going to strike it. I was like, wow, you are powerful. Usually it's the judge that does the striking. <laughs> you just have to move to strike, but wow. The cute. other one is uh, harass- uh, harassing and oppressive. And I thought the question's on, do you think it's okay to steal your other family member's <laughs> yeah, inheritance? That's harassing. That's harassing. Yeah. It's not only argumentative, it's harassing. Yeah. And so You're those, trying to get under their skin. That's right. It's not appropriate. Um, incomplete hypothetical. I saw this one a lot when I was a young lawyer, and I think it's because I learned things by analogy a lot. And so I would ask questions by analogy. Mm. I've kind of cut that out of my deposition skill set, which I think is a good thing. Because you just go right to the heart of it rather than... Yeah, right. Because the minute you start giving, well, let me tell you, let me set this up, you're going to draw this objection, even though nobody really knows what it means. (laughs) And that's an incomplete hypothetical. And then I've never seen this uh, objection made before because it's so long, but I may try it in a couple of depositions to see how it goes. Uh, objections that are not reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. So isn't, wouldn't that be irrelevant? Relevance? No, because relevance, uh, relevance is actually a, is something that can come in at trial, right? Because if it's relevant, it comes in. If there's a foundation for it, if there's no hearsay, something can come into evidence. But in discovery, right. we're not talking about evidence. We're simply talking about evidence or anything that could likely lead to the discovery of evidence. So this is something, this is a question that's so far outside the scope of the litigation that it wouldn't even lead to the discovery of evidence. Correct. It's not evidence, and it wouldn't even lead to the discovery of evidence. That's right. So if I'm suing you for an estate, and I have a bunch of questions about, I don't know, something that happened in your college days. Right. It has nothing to do with what we're doing now. That's that right. wouldn't even lead to the discovery of evidence. That's right. If, if, if uh, you know, Brett Kavanaugh, it's a great example. I mean, obviously, he was going on the Supreme Court, so it mattered. Yeah. But let's say he's in a deposition for an auto accident last year, and somebody wants to talk to him about his drinking days. In college. In college, yeah. yeah. That, that's just, I mean, not only is that harassing, I mean, it's a whole litany of these things. Well, uh, that's what I'm thinking is that right. it's irrelevant. It is harassing, but it's also, I haven't heard of this. I haven't heard anybody even make that objection before. It's a long one. The one last, uh, there's two more, but one last one would be that when the opposing attorney's taking a friendly witness's deposition, there, you have to treat that like a direct testimony. Mm-hmm. So you better be making leading object, objections about leading the witness. Mm-hmm. They need to ask them direct questions, like on direct examination, no leading which questions. are open-ended questions. That's right. right. And so um, finally, one more. Um, this lawyer did this over and over again, and I found a real effective way to deal with it. And you can see it was really bothering her. But she would put a document in front of the client and say, uh, do you, do, you, do, you, do you see privileged and protected information? Do you see that? And the client would be like, yes, I see that. That's what that says, right? <laughs> and so there is an objection that I made up, and I think we lawyers make it up, and that is, look, the document speaks for itself, right? right? We would say yeah. that at trial, too. Yeah, the document speaks for itself. Yeah. And so I finally got – I kept making that objection. And I was making some headway with it because she would roll her eyes and so forth, which she just wasn't going to give up on this. Every document she put down, she would do the same thing. So I finally said, counsel, are you asking my client to tell you if that's what the actual words are on the paper, like the black and white words on that paper? You want her to tell you those that's are – That's what it is. Those are there? 
So I did that three or four times, and then she went away from it. That reminds me of that Chris Farley skit on Saturday Night Live where he's sitting with John with uh, Paul McCartney. He's like, "Remember, remember when you were with the Beatles? That yeah. was cool, wasn't it?" Yeah, <laughs> that's like the extent of what he says. Right, they hit his head. Yeah, yeah right. stupid, stupid, yeah, stupid, stupid. And then Paul's so nice about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, and the whole document speaks for itself thing. I mean, that's confusing until you really understand why that objection's there. And once you kind of understand how that works and you've been through a few trials, then it makes more sense. But so many attorneys will put a document in front of somebody and say, can you read this? And then say, that's true, isn't it? Or it says that, doesn't it? Or whatever. And it's like, I don't understand that line of questioning. It's just such a waste of time. So just for any young attorneys out there, Keith and I were in a trial once and we had a lot of documents and the attorney we were going against on their side, she was an ace. And she, we learned a lot from her, didn't we? Yeah. But part of it was we weren't quite saying do you see what's on this document? That's what it is. We didn't really know the dance move for that. And so just so you know, what you do is you take the exhibit, Mm -hmm. you put it in front of the witness, and you say, I'm going to go to paragraph three, line two. Line two says the following. We diagnosed so-and-so with dementia on January 1, 2018. Although some courts won't even let you read that. Okay. You have to read it yourself. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe not. But then I would say, then I would say, on January 1, 2018, were you around your mother? Did you have yeah, time yes, with no. your mother? Did right. you see your mother? Did you appear at that time to see any changes in her mental cognitive functioning? So none of those questions have anything to do with what's written on the page. That's right. They just have to do with a time period contemporaneous with what's written on the page. Yeah, and I think that most judges in a bench trial are going to let you read something like that in an exhibit, even though it hasn't come into evidence. Sometimes, uh, yeah. I think most cases I've been involved with, maybe you've, you've had different experience, but I think juries, that's a different story because right. you have to publish that to the jury and then you can move forward with it. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tricky stuff. But I mean, how many people are good at taking depositions? It takes time to really learn the skills. And I think you have to work at it. Uh, I will tell you that uh, Bill Lowe, I'll just say his name, he's an attorney in downtown San Diego, bar none the best not only the best taker of depositions I've ever been around, but maybe one of the best cross-examiners I've seen in my experience as a lawyer. He was phenomenal. Uh, He was opposing me at the time, too. (laughs) Which isn't Uh, a good way to learn. But but we actually got along beautifully. And the reason we got along was because Bill knew what he had to do, and nothing bothered him. And he just knew what he was doing. It was, you know, the case The case ended up settling, thankfully. But I will say that he is a very fine attorney. I would only hope that I get a chance to see him do some more work. Yeah. Well, and it takes skill and it takes time. It takes time to develop the skill to know what you're doing. So, I mean, after a few thousand depositions, you know, you definitely know what you're doing at this point. So, all right. Well, that's about all the time that we have for this week. I want to thank you for joining us. If you have any questions for us, feel free to email us. You can reach me at keith at aldavlaw.com, or you can reach Stuart at stuart, S-T-E-W-A-R-T, at aldavlaw.com. We look forward to seeing you next week. We'll see you next week.